Welcome to Insight. Today we're chatting with Dr. John Long, Vice President of Research and Collections at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. With a staff of just under 300 professionals, including 50 scientists and researchers, the Natural History Museum is the largest museum of its kind in the Western United States, with collections encompassing more than 35 million diverse specimens and artifacts covering 4.5 billion years of history. Long joined the Natural History Museum after serving as head of the sciences at Museum Victoria in Australia. An internationally known paleontologist and author of both scholarly and popular works that explain the science of paleontology, he has named more than 50 species of extinct animals and has written 25 books and 200 scientific essays and articles. His work was most recently featured as a cover story on the origins of sex in Scientific American. John has generously agreed to share some of his insights with us. And I'd like to thank you, John, for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here, Mark. And it's been a crazy first year, but, but a wonderful experience. I'm so glad to be living here in Los Angeles. So you have quite a reputation as a researcher, as a scientist, as a paleontologist. Why have you selected as the venue for your career museums as opposed to uh, being in a, in a university uh, research setting? Well, I think it's a, a natural evolution because most of the universities tend to be driven these days by the more hardcore, economically applicable research, whereas museums are the last bastion of pure taxonomy, uh, of paleontology, of investigative natural history for, for the sake of discovering new knowledge. And that's what we do. Our curators on a daily basis go out find things, write them up, and the end product is new knowledge that we add to the world's body of, of information. So the value is knowledge because knowledge is, is, a, is a good. It's a social good. It's a, it's a it, it satisfies a deep and yearning curiosity that humans have always had. Uh, ever since the cavemen days, they need to know what the different species of animals and plants are and, and what their properties are. Now to that extent, our work is not just for pure knowledge. Many of our curators go out and discover new species of, of insects or fish that may have economically uh, useful applications or provide uh, genetic or, or chemical uh, products further down in development. If these uh, discoveries are not commercializable, uh, how does the funding work for that type of, uh, of endeavor? Because that is uh, of considerable expense. Yes, well I wouldn't say they're all not entirely commercial, but um, generally they're, they're about discovering the depth of our biodiversity and how that relates to the changes going on in the environment today, whether they're natural or man-made. But a lot of the funding comes from the National Science Foundation, the NSF, which funds research that is all about the building blocks of the, the ecosystem. In other words, our guys might discover the new species of fish or insects or whatever, but people working on the higher up the chain work out the value of that biodiversity to the whole organic system. And for example, if, you, if you're looking at managing a sustainable fisheries in the Pacific, um, you first have to understand the biology of your fishes. I mean, it was recently discovered that in off Australia and New Zealand, they were catching these fish called orange ruffy mm -hmm. and selling them commercially very cheaply. And it wasn't until the fish biologists, the taxonomists, came in and studied them, they realised these fish were 70 to 100 years old and we didn't have any idea of their breeding cycle. So in order to manage a sustainable industry for that fish, you first got to do the science and then it informs the rest of the commercial process. So describe a, a little bit about how research and collections in particular is organized at, at this museum and, and how that compares to the organization of other museums. Okay, well we have both the natural sciences and also uh, a human sciences or, or cultural side of our museum. Um, the natural sciences include everything from geology, minerals, paleontology, marine biology, the terrestrial sciences that, that study birds, mammals and reptiles, uh, insects of course. And the cultural side includes history, anthropology and archaeology, which is all about the, uh, both the present and recent and deep past history of human civilization. In terms of the work that your, uh, your various researchers are, are doing, uh, is it 
in reference to the uh, collections that you have? And perhaps you can describe some yes, of those I, collections. Yes, I mean, that, that's hitting the nail on the head. This is where museum research fundamentally differs from all other institutions because our mandate is to do research on, around and about our collections that enhances and adds value to those collections because we know more about them. Or through their research, we add to the collections, such as when we go out every year and dig up new dinosaurs and bring the specimens back to the museum. Now, some of those specimens that might have been dug up in the 1950s or 60s have, have been stored in the museum in the dusty cabinets for many years, and now we're suddenly dusting them off and getting them out for our new exhibitions. And there's a wealth of material from those old expeditions. You know, our museum, for example, has four Tyrannosaurus skeletons. One of the things that was so fascinating to me as, as a layperson was to see how these specimens are maintained, catalogued, often by volunteers who have become educated in the process of preserving uh, these specimens and how through the generations uh, these specimens are, are um, carefully safeguarded uh, for future research. They are in fact a repository of undiscovered knowledge. Yes, I believe that's the most fundamentally important thing that museums do today is they conserve and keep these wonderful treasures so future generations can utilize them. And uh, it's no mean feat. There's a lot of work that goes into the conservation of things. When you collect something, it's, uh, it goes through an initial preparation, whether it be a bug that gets a pin through it or, or a fish that gets put into, from formal into alcohol. But then it's the long-term care that you have to go back and revisit these yeah. things periodically, top up those jars, check that there's no decay happening in the specimens. Um, so a lot of the work is done by volunteers and people that uh, would like to just sit there all day and enter data into a computer or, 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 or check on things. It's very mundane work and we've got a limited number of professionals to look after such a big collection. So we do rely on the, the goodwill of volunteers to help with that job. And as, as simple and sophisticated as climactic control, sunlight exposure, um, how the uh, materials are handled, uh, it all amounts to a very sophisticated uh, uh, process that is quite costly. Indeed, and most people would, would think of museum collections as being static, you know, things inside drawers and cabinets, but, but that's not so. You know, every year we have hundreds of loans that we service other museums around the world. Uh, particular specialists in, in Europe or China or, or anywhere might be wanting to borrow some specimens for a particular research project they're doing. Our guys might collaborate with them and then send them the material. So there's also the toing and the coming and going of material and also the fact that we borrow material from other museums. So there's a lot of processing that goes on and, and it has to be done professionally and carefully with, with all due um, care given to those specimens. And in a sense, aren't you also the, the guardian of humanity and that other museums will have other collections and in order to get a full picture of, for example, impact on the climate, uh, it might be uh, necessary to take information from collections across the world oh, and, yeah. and, and bring that together. Absolutely. And the collections have increasing value as time goes on because of new technology, new discoveries. I mean, once upon a time, a, a frog that was in a jar was simply no more than a pickled frog. Now we can extract ancient DNA out of those specimens. We have specimens that are completely extinct. We have the only record of them in, left that humanity can study. Uh, now with increasing uh, emphasis on looking at the environment, environmental pressures on organisms, we can go back and not only look at the DNA of those organisms, we can look at various isotopic ratios that indicates uh, the kinds of food they were eating or changes in the environment at that time. Fossils in particular that go back hundreds of thousands and millions of years give us a wonderful record of climate shifts and we measure them through isotopic changes in, in carbon or oxygen levels and uh, with increasing technological development, we get increasing resolution and, and precision on those kinds of uh, research projects. And do you collaborate with organizations that might have access to these very expensive uh, analytical instruments uh, in order to, to conduct your work? Oh yes, absolutely. Um, our scientists are collaborating with teams all around the world. Um, on Monday, for example, uh, Dr. Lewis Chiapi, a dinosaur expert, is flying up to look at the synchrotron at Stanford and, and, and engage with a project there. We use high resolution CT scanners, we use uh, all sorts of X-ray diffraction and uh, transmission electron microscope equipment to analyze our minerals. 
um, basically we have the raw materials that everybody needs to do a, a whole variety of research projects from every spectrum around the world. What is the practical significance of the collection? If you're not researching, perhaps the science is a little bit too, too distant. Um, how do you take the work that is so complicated to explain, you make it seem easy, but there, there's so much behind this, and, and, and make it accessible? Well, we do that in a number of ways, Mark. I mean, there's the, the initial work, the research on the specimens has its first product, which is generally a scientific paper, an academic paper that few people will get access to, even though many of them now have free access on the web. Published but, in a journal, published yeah, in a... Yeah, in peer-reviewed like and published in a, in a respected scholarly journal. Um, secondary from that, a lot of the work filters down into popular science magazines. There's an article in New Scientist this week, for example, which cites some of our scientists giving their opinions about the evolution of birds. Um, an article in Scientific American coming out in January 2011, which is again about the research that, that, that I've done and, and some of our guys are, have, have been involved with. And then popular uh, educational uh, edutainment, I guess, the, 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 the work of the Discovery Channel to, to bring some of... Exactly. Uh, we, we have a whole range of media involvement with disseminating science to the general public through things like that. Even our programs at the museum, like the Dinosaur Puppets, which, uh, the, you know, the, the, the spoken words of those shows are actually first passed through the, the actual curatorial experts to make sure they're correct. And finally, we have a number of events, like the curatorial cupboards, where our cu curators will come in on a, on a weekend, get out their favourite specimens from the collection, and talk to people all day about it, and enthuse them about why the science is important. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how the uh, people who experience this give you information back on whether you are being effective, whether, you, wh whether they are understanding um, in, in the fullness of your intent. Yeah, I suppose there's a number of ways we can gauge it. One is the, the large number of members that we have and how they become involved with, with the museum and often in the surveys say that it's just because they have a particular love of something like, like natural history or, or, or history. Um, there's also the direct feedback we get with um, the public, with some of our programs. Uh, we have a bug fair once a year, for example, and it's a, one of the busiest weekends of the year for the museum. Every part of it, there are stalls, there are insects, there are recipes for cooking insects, books. Our guys, our curators and our staff are there and heavily involved. And we're hoping to utilise this whole interactivity between the public and science in our North Campus development at the moment and have a, a, a real focus on citizen science where people can come in, make observations about the natural history of the, of the very grounds of the museum in terms of the insects, the birds and, and so on and feed that data into a computer that will eventually add up to, to meaningful research information. So knowledge and learning as an, as an entertainment activity? Indeed. Imagine being able to go into the museum and then spend a lot of your time outdoors in a, in a, in a thickly forested part of the front garden. Where in, we've, in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, where we've specially attracted different species of birds through bird feeders. And you can observe the comings and goings of those species and record them. And that data doesn't get thrown away. It gets utilised and builds up a big storage data uh, about the, you know, the, the frequency of these birds in this area at different times and so on. Um, but more so than that, the, the biodiversity of the urban region is so poorly known in Los Angeles. To give you an example, one of our curators was chatting to one of our board members a while ago and threw down the gauntlet that uh, he could find a new species anywhere, even in <laughs> local backyard in Los Angeles. And did the board member take up the... Yes, indeed. Okay. And so we put a, a malaise trap, a simple trap with some you know, um, food in it that attracts flies and things. Within a week, he studied what was in that trap and he had one completely new species, new to science. He had another fly that had only ever been recorded in Europe and another one that had only ever been found in South America. And that was just in a week. So we're hoping to capitalise on this uh, unknown quantity about the biodiversity of Los Angeles and do really intense studies in our own grounds uh, to find out what is the full extent of the urban biodiversity of Los Angeles. What do we know about it? What don't we know about it? And this will be the beginning of a whole series of many years of measurement that will help us track the change in biodiversity with changes in climate or changes in habitat that, that will be happening in the next century. Now, you've been here for a year. 
And in that year, um, there had been a considerable transformation. Could you talk a little bit about what you found uh, when, you, when you originally came and, and how research and collection um, was existing within the, the institution and, and how that, um, that has evolved over the last year and how you wish it to evolve in the future? Well, I've come into a, a dynamic and a vibrant organization that's in the middle of this massive transformation, $135 million dollar uh, development of new galleries, its grounds, its campus and so on, and its amenities as well. But the section that I'm particularly in charge of, the Research and Collections Group, which is the, the largest group in the museum, it includes all the curators, collection managers, well, we're charged with the responsibility of looking after those 35 million specimens and how, they, how they're conserved and utilised. But that section had been leaderless for about three years in terms of uh, the last person in my position had passed away in 2007, early 2007, and had been in a caretaker role ever since. So it was a section hungry for leadership, needed someone to, to come in and that understood the work, the complex work of the division, and to be able to um, quickly get, get your head around it and, and see where the priorities lie. And I think my first year was really getting to grips with knowing everybody and their work, seeing the, the urgent things that needed fixing, and then putting into plan some long-term strategic planning to how we're going to build that section. Did the scientists and, and uh, other professionals that were part of this, this group, um, did they feel that their work had been negatively impacted during that three-year period? I wouldn't say negatively impacted. I just think that uh, not having adequate representation at the higher levels of, of the senior executive and, and board meetings um, was what they were lacking. And now, as a spokesperson for the great work that they do, I make sure that uh, we report everything that they do to the board and at the senior executive level. And it's something people actually look forward to now, the RNC reports, because we make it an interesting um, section in what is otherwise often very business-like series of meetings. And we can talk about new discoveries we've made or new acquisitions or new field work we've just come back from. And um, people always love to hear about it. And perhaps there was not as much lateral communication amongst the various groups as people are, are focused on their area. Um, it's, it's rather difficult to take one's head up a bit and look at someone else's area and form those, uh, those uh, friendly co-opetition type of relationships that are so, that's so important to the Yes, I think that for, for too long or for many years, uh, people in the institution had viewed the, the curatorial side as being very siloed, people in their own little little areas, little empires and just working away at their own things and it's really been my chief mission to sort of focus everybody on the mission of the museum and how we're all working together. We're not in competition with any other parts of the museum but we've all got this this wonderful mission that we're all um, um, throwing our our hard energy and work into to, to see the, the opening of not only these galleries but the scientific programs that will go with them. Is there greater utilization of, of common resources uh, now, or is that not so much of a factor? Given I, think, I think there is, Mark. Um, you know, there's the basic resources that the museum has for, for running its day-to-day -day business. Uh, but R&C builds uh, a lot of its uh, research capacity through the grants that we bring in, and that is a main target. And if we can increase the quality of the research that we output, we immediately increase the strike rate of our grants. So building up a, a stronger research capacity has been one of my chief objectives with, with the um, museum. And in doing that, it's really about shifting the thinking in, in how the scientists actually publish their work, where they publish it, how they should aim to much higher, more uh, better quality journals, and also increase the, the success of the grants that they apply for. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, about some of the work, if, if you wouldn't mind highlighting some of that very wonderful work. Yeah, it is amazing that, that getting to know all the curators um, as, as not just colleagues but friends, you know, the, the amount of work they do is truly extraordinary. These are people that, that, that work day and night and come in on weekends and they live for their work. And the passion is, the is passion just is amazing. The passion is palpable. Uh, our mineralogist, for example, Dr. Tony Kempf, I was totally blown away to discover he'd been working on naming new mineral species, mostly from the Baker region in the Otto Hills, you know, in Central California, Southern California. And he described over 14 species of new minerals just in the past year and a half. Um, this year he'll have something like 27 peer-reviewed scientific papers out. He's, he's a, a force to be reckoned with, 
but he loves his work and he's got his lab set up so it's humming along. Does he ever sleep? Um, he does. He's a very <laughs> nice guy. And, um, you know, he's, he's built a team up that he can work with internationally. So it's not him writing these papers by himself. It's him and about eight others on every paper. And it's this international collaboration and teamwork that is a strength to greater productivity in research. But, but right across the board, I mean, our dinosaur curator, Louis Carpi, is uh, not only working on a major gallery at the moment that's going to be one of the best dinosaur halls in the world, but he's just produced an amazing body of work over the last year. He described um, a specimen that's going in that gallery, a great marine lizard called a mosasaur, and we dusted it off to, uh, to clean it up for the exhibit. And lo and behold, when Lewis looked at it, he realised it had skin impressions. And, and look, uh, looking up closer, a team studied it, found it had colour pigments preserved, it had bronchial tubes. And the tail of this thing, which was thought to be a swimming lizard, was inflected and had a big tail fluke, like a tuna. Uh -huh. So it changed our whole global perspective on this group of, of giant extinct reptiles, the mosasaurs, how they lived, what they were like, and now we've got the world's best specimen which is going to feature in this gallery. Which had been gathering dust. Yeah, and there's numerous examples of that kind of work. Um, our echinoderm expert, for example, Gordon Hendler, who studies starfish and brittle stars, you might think that's a relatively boring area to study, but he recently did some work where they were looking at the um, little crystals of calcite that form particular lenses on the arms of these starfish. They actually focus light onto the nerves they're now being studied by other groups at Harvard and, and other parts of the United States in terms of uh, you know, refining laser development of how light can affect the nervous system. You know, so all sorts of amazing spin-offs from the sort of primary research that we do and where someone else will look at our research and say, wow, I think that connects with my research. And you know, those sort of international connections and collaborations are the really exciting developments. So nowadays when I track and report on our research, it's not just the primary work we do, I also give examples of where our collections have been lent to other institutions and major papers have been published. And it shows that it's a greater, a greater field of productivity than just the core work that we do. Now you've indicated in, in some of your descriptions uh, that there is an intense collaboration um, with the exhibitions part of the museum and also the marketing piece. Yes. So you've got this communication element. Could you talk a little bit about how you, um, you work internally uh, with exhibitions and how that dialogue evolves into the type of exhibitions that have scientific content but can also uh, uh, feed the popular interest, which of course is important. Yes. Well, our new Age of Mammals Gallery, which opened in July this year, has received fantastic acclaim in terms of wonderful reviews. It had a whole full page review in the journal Science just raving, glowing about it. And to achieve that sort of perfect balance between the scholarly and the popular is a very fine line and it's a very arbitrary line. But we had a team of curators led by John Harris, who's lead curator. And uh, in addition to that, working with the exhibition team and the consultants that translate the science into the into the general level and, and, and basically are uh, the ears of the public to how does this sound or how does this read. Um, in addition to those layers that, that fine tune it and get it to a, to a level that's exciting and readable, um, I was able to, to come in and, and read over a lot of the text and put my you know, sort of feelings on it. And Jane as well, the CEO, she's wonderful the way she will come in and read every label and then if she says something or it doesn't gel with her, she'll say it and then we'll fine tune it again. So when we finally produced it, then we, we check it on the public. We do audience market evaluation. So, so you take it off Broadway, as it were, and, and, and test it out. Yeah, yeah, it goes through further evaluation and um, you know, there's opportunities to fine tune. I think we got it really right with Age of Mammals and with Dinosaurs, that the next big exhibition that'll open in July 2011. We're building on what we've learned from that to, to even make it uh, more refined. In terms of the interaction between the very traditional um, categorization um, of these museums and of the sciences and the cross-cutting questions of, of today, of, of sustainability, uh, global warming, uh, environmental change, um, and so on, um, how, how do you deal with, with the different ways that people are now thinking about our world? 
with our Age of Mammals gallery, which was based on the six catchwords of uh, climates change, continents move, uh, mammals evolve, naturally we had to uh, address the issue of climate change, both in prehistory, how natural climate change has driven bursts of evolution in mammals, but also recently how the rate of change is far greater than the natural rates measured in the past. And so we did that rather simply by having a reference to a website which we put up a whole lot of references to what we consider are informative and educational websites about climate change. There weren't just websites for adults, there were websites for children, websites for teachers, websites that would suit everybody, even a, a link to where they could offset their carbon if they felt like doing it. So you're, you're communicating with different audiences. Is that why you write children's books? Yes. Um, I've always enjoyed writing children's books since my kids were little and um, I've sort of continued it up until quite recently. I'm, I'm not writing one at the moment but my last one came out last year which was a book about human civilization. But I'm always fascinated by how much people don't know about science and the scientific process. I find that when you break it down to a level that a child can understand, adults generally get it straight away. So I often go into my writing for children mode when I, when I explain complex science to adults. So I, I can't end this interview without asking the burning question. Um, let's talk about sex. Yeah. <laughs> Why, how did I become a world expert on the yeah, origin on, of sex? On sex? I stumbled upon it because for 25 years I've worked on these fossil fish from the Kimberley in the mm -hmm. north of Australia, a site called Gogo. And unlike the way you imagine a fossil fish as a, like a kipper between two pieces of rock, this site, they're three-dimensionally perfect. So we actually etch the bones out of the rock using weak acetic acid, which dissolves the rock but not the bone, and the whole skeletons come out. Anyway, about two years ago, I discovered a specimen from this site that had an embryo inside it, still attached by a fossilised umbilical structure. And this totally blew us away because we not only discovered the world's oldest embryo of any vertebrate inside this 380 million year old armoured fish called a placoderm, but it just dawned on us that it must have been having sex, internal fertilisation, to, to have an embryo inside it rather than laying eggs. And that led us on this search for sexual dimorphism, looking at differences between males and females in the very first vertebrates, and we found them. And we were able to publish these results in a series of three papers in the journal Nature between 2008 and 2009. So the, the article that comes out in Scientific American in 2011, January, is a, a popular account of, of these discoveries. And does that change the, um, the material support for an institution like a natural history museum? Which, after all, these, these museums were founded uh, in the Victorian age. That's a very good point. Um, I feel that the more popular science we get out there to the general audience, it basically reflects back on the institution. They see our name appearing everywhere. This week, if I open a copy of New Scientist, they'll see a quote from one of our scientists that, that mentions the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Next month, they'll open Scientific American. They'll see it again. And so it sort of psychologically drums in that we are an authoritative place to turn to for information. And of course that sinks in when people are refereeing grants. I think the two go hand in hand, that the scholarly work and the application of serious you know, NSF funded grant money and the popularization of science, um, the more you do, the two go together, the, the higher the success rate. How do you feel about First Fridays, a party within the Natural History Museum? I absolutely love it. It's my favorite thing to do. I went to every one of them last year. Five o'clock, I'll take off the tie, I'll wander down, I'll grab a beer and chat to people. And it's absolutely one of the best things that the museum does. And uh, plus the wonderful talks, of course, that we have by the various experts. People having fun in a museum instead of going to the ball game or, or staying home and watching TV instead of going to a movie with lots of explosions or... The excitement really is, is vibrant. And, um, and then the discussions that, you know, then you go off and have a beer and chat about it. Wow, wasn't that great? And at the higher level, we sometimes have dinners in the boardroom with the speaker uh, for, the, for the fellows and donors and, and board members. So, you know, there's all levels of participation from the casual to the formal that go, go on on our first Fridays and everybody enjoys it and has a great time. What do you think the future is for these institutions in the next 10 and, and 20 years? I think the most important thing that large museums have to focus on is really the fundamental care of their collections to make sure that they are properly maintained with the right standards. 
Um, but generally, just to keep doing what we're doing in terms of developing exhibitions, that each time we develop an exhibition, we go one step further and make it more accessible to the psyche of the general population. You know, the future of museums is to make them more as not just a place where people come to see exhibitions or, or hear a program and have a good time, but to be safe forums for the sort of debates that can't go on elsewhere. You know, we, we could be the safe houses to talk about sticky issues with the environment or, or, or politics. Or evolution. Or evolution, exactly. So hopefully we'll become more vibrant, more interactive, more a place communities turn to uh, for information and, um, and debate. I'd like to thank you and your staff for vitalizing, revitalizing, and keeping vital this wonderful institution and this wonderful field. Thank you so much for your insights, John. Thank you, Mark.